thing is, like, there's like a zero success rate that's going to happen with the bear. So I've actually been in the woods both with a bear and with a man. The bear went straight for the snacks, stole the snacks, and then went right back to doing bear things, right? I've also been in the woods with a man. Now, I'm going to tell you, quite honestly, uh, the man was interested in a lot more than snacks and uh, was not interested in leaving me alone. Okay, I've been seeing this discourse about bear versus man, which would you rather run into? And having worked in the wilderness and run into a lot of bears and men in the wilderness, I want to weigh on this. And I've also did a reported story on this. Also, just look at my dog's turkey legs back there. He's a little frog dog thing. Also, I'm linking that video. That's one of my absolute favorite people to follow and learn from. Uh, she wrote this book, which is a must read for any feminist. And I've seen so many takes, but something about this take just made it so simple for me to understand. And it leads me to my story about men stalking. Men stalk us in, in, in the wilderness. Um, bears don't. So let me get into this. So just, just to show you, this is a glacier, Montana. Um, I went to, to college in Montana. This is um, where I f saw my first grizzly bear. This is before I actually worked in the outdoors. I was just getting to know what this all, whole world was like. This was literally the moment right after I saw the grizzly bear. And I got my little bear mace right there, which is, you know, pretty worthless. But anyway, I also have been a climber for a long time. I also worked in Yellowstone um, one summer. Ran into bears all the time and bison and all kinds of animals. I also used to cook in the outdoors for hundreds of children sometimes. And I dealt with so many animals being the person in charge of food. I also have been on a, a raft guide and led trips like this. And so managing animals in the wilderness and food, I have a lot of insight and experience with them. And honestly, raccoons are the biggest menace <laughs> in the wilderness. Anyway, hands down, any day, any day, I would rather run into a bear. I would literally rather run into any predator. But just so we're clear, bears don't actually want to unalive people. Before I get into all the instances of just how dangerous men are in the wilderness and how they literally will not leave us alone, just to get some facts out there, what do bears eat? Well, a grizzly bear, which you will probably never see in your life unless you live in Montana or Alaska or Canada or visit one of those places, and even still, you're probably not going to run into one. Even grizzly bears, they don't eat much meat. They don't hunt things. They are mostly vegetarians unless they're, um, you know, near uh, salmon. And we know they eat a lot of salmon and stuff, but usually the meat that bears eat is like leftover dead stuff. And the black bear, the American black bear, vegetarian diet. This is what they're supposed to eat. They don't want to eat us. They don't want to harm us. The only time they are like pissed and want to hurt us is if we're messing with them, scaring them. Especially if, if it's a mama bear with her cubs, that is literally the most dangerous scenario you could ever be in with a bear. That's it, period. Other than like a polar bear or like some other scenario. But usually it's people scaring bears that makes them eat us. And they just want our food because even though they eat this diet, humans have made it so that some of them have to rely on trash cans and stuff because we, and by we, I mean capitalism, white supremacy culture, and just this like colonizing destructive nature, They're literally killing everything. But you know, anyway, so yeah, they're adapting. Plant food makes up more than 90% of uh, bears diets usually, unless you're literally talking about polar bears and stuff like that, where they eat seals and stuff. Most bears that you would ever run into don't want to eat you. Honestly, they want nothing to do with us. But men, that's another story. Now, before I get into all of this, because I have a lot to say, so watch out. I'm going to give some tips at the end on how to stay safe in the wilderness, because the last thing I ever want to do is discourage women, especially from going into the wilderness. I also know as a white woman, my experience in the wilderness is going to be very different. I have a, a much different history with the wilderness and what happens in the woods. Despite how dangerous the woods is for me, it is far safer than any black, indigenous, and other woman of color, but especially black women. And I'm going to give you some people to follow at the end who have amazing stories and insights about that and the intersection of all these things that happens in the woods. But let's just talk about men's obsession with being 
a menace to women. So I wrote this for the Daily Beast um, a couple years ago, a few years ago. This is literally one of my proudest things I've ever written. And also this was like so, so traumatizing doing the reporting on this and hearing these women's stories, but I'm really glad that they came to light. So what I discovered in this reporting is that um, stalking, schmegel harassment, and even assault is, you know, what women have to worry about out there. But even sometimes, schmurder. Because not too long ago on the Appalachian Trail, they literally had a dude with a machete who women tried to talk to the FBI about and you know the authorities he was arrested on multiple charges was ordered to stay off the trail but of course he returned anyway threatened to pour gasoline on four campers and burn them alive in their tent it's this nasty man up there there's this picture and then later he ended up chasing two of them down unalive the guy tried to unalive the woman um she played dead after getting stabbed and then ran for her life to get help once he left. So in this article, I talk about how the outdoor industry's long overdue Me Too movement. And actually there's another story about a um, domestic violence I'm gonna cover soon that um, is, there's finally some justice on that in the climate community, but that's another story. But the the, the, the main pur purpose of this story and the other stories is not just to talk about these men, but it's basically all the men who enable these men who make these places more dangerous because they either won't do anything or these good guy, nice guy hikers literally end up becoming just as much of a nightmare as these like psychos. I also want to point out that, uh, you know, the, what, what in my reporting and my experience, because I actually, you know, used to be an outward bound instructor and we did parts of the Appalachian Trail and boy, did we meet some interesting people. We go through all these little towns and then of course the Appalachian Trail, for those of you who don't know, it starts in uh, Georgia and ends in Maine. And you know, the parts that go through the South, um, imagine that those are not only more dangerous in general, uh, for women especially, but absolutely more dangerous for women of color. But like I say here, um, the, the Appalachian Trail is, it's a microcosm for the United States in general. I mean, you know, it's probably for a lot of places, but I'm just gonna talk about the United States in this one. Statistically, women are way safer on the trail though, than college campuses and in their own homes. Because what the takeaway here is not like, don't go hiking. It's be safe when you're hiking. And I just want, basically this whole point is to call out men. Because at the end of the day, your home is always gonna be more dangerous than this trail ever will be, ever. Because of your family members and any boyfriend or husband or just any man, any brother, any cousin, any dude that you let into your home is always gonna be more of a menace than any of these forkers I'm gonna talk about. So your chances of getting unalived on the trail are a thousand times less than in the United States as a whole. And yet the problem is the absence of like deadbolts and actual physical safety is why the stakes are so high for women out there. Because there's nothing to deter these men from being violent. You cannot lock your tent. It's literally a thin piece of nylon <laughs> and hiding and not letting someone know that it's a woman in that tent that literally is the only thing that protects you from any of these dudes just doing whatever they want. And yet they, what people are like, think that bears are the thing to be afraid of. No. On rare occasions, bears have attacked people, but it's usually because they've had some other stuff going on because of humans that has put them in that position. But this is almost never going to happen. A bear is almost never going to attack you and eat you in the middle of sleep. But a man, well, can't say the same thing. But even still, still less likely than you dating a dude. That's the truth. So please do not be deterred from the outdoors because of this piece. That is literally the opposite point I'm trying to make. It's just, uh, we just have to approach it differently than men and not trust any of them, none of them, until they have prove, proven something. Ever give any of these men in the outdoors the benefit of the doubt, ever. One of the women that I, I interviewed said, I physically ran into a bear. And I take that, <laughs> that over running into a crazy drunk dude any day. And that is the truest, truest statement there. Same here. I would absolutely much rather literally run into a bear than a man in the woods by myself, or not even by myself, just in general. All the women I spoke to, besides having overall, you know, great experiences with most men on the trail, all it takes is one to literally traumatize women or end their life or destroy all their dreams, like doing the AT. And especially the most menacing ones on the trail um, are older white men. It's the older white, it's like, so <laughs> Julie said that she even got older white men, especially telling her to smile more on the trail, like, okay. So in her personal story, first hiking partner who seemed progressive um, asked her to rub his leg. Another one later on repeatedly hit on her and made her feel unsafe. The other guys in her group eventually sided with her and ditched him, but only after she showed him enough evidence, including his unnerving, in, uh, unnerving texts. The fact that none of her male friends would believe her 
until she showed so much evidence is the point of this article right here that I'm right, that I wrote. Later, while hiking alone, another random dude aggressively probed her about where she was going, who she was with, then found her 200 miles down the trail and threatened to come into women's tents while they slept. Another woman I interviewed said she was gaslit by so many of these male allies. Yes, I'm telling you, these outdoor men are exhausting. They think they're progressive and they literally make our lives harder out there. So Hillary York said that the 2,190 mile trek, three men made her life hard. Two of them um, were sketchy enough for all the men to understand why, but the third was your standard hippie type. This one dude was like always undressing her with his eyes, he was clearly looking for a hookup. But the problem that she had, like whatever, this is nothing new for her. The problem that she had was that these men who are like a part of her tramley, they're like a trail family is like what they call it, told them that he made her uncomfortable. They thought she was being dramatic and overly sensitive. Her female friends, on the other hand, unanimously agreed, no, this dude's creepy. The most frustrating thing is having your own intuition downplayed, she said. And that's why she turned to Facebook. Now, this is one of the most frustrating things about this whole reporting, is that because men were so worthless in the wilderness to help women protect themselves from other men, women had to literally create Facebook groups to inform them of um, problematic men, stalkers. And that's literally how they all stayed safe from that dude who ended up unaliving a couple, or tried to unalive a couple and unalive that dude. They had been they had been talking about him and warning everybody where he was, what mile marker, what he was up to, and the FBI, the, and the shocker, the police and them were like completely worthless. So women had to take matters in their own hands. Now imagine going on backpacking for the whole summer. Don't you think people who go backpacking are doing it to get away from, I don't know, their phone? and social media, right? The last thing women want to do when they're in the wilderness backpacking trip is have to check freaking Facebook to see if there is like a stalker. But that's, that's they had no choice. And thank God for these groups. Now again, some there's actually problems within these groups with uh, misogynoir and all kinds of other stuff. Shocker, I'm gonna get to that in a little bit. But these groups were like, if they didn't have this, a lot of these women would have gotten in a lot of more serious life-threatening situations. So because of all these James Jordan and all these like literal, all it takes again is one man. So because the stakes are so high out there, women have to assume because this is life and death when you have nothing to protect you other than a nylon tent and maybe a self-defense class. I know some women pack, but um, I, don't run a, I don't want to ever say that is the solution to this. If that's what your solution is, then great, but not a lot of women aren't comfortable doing that. So having, and obviously this won't apply in other countries where like you can't just get a pew pew. So even though uh, York, you know, has like a solid poker face, it still didn't protect her, but she did found like it, it was, you know, a little bit safer for her than, than a lot of other women, especially younger women on the trail who had kind of like a, like a kinder face or like, and that, that's totally me. I'm the kind of person who like until recently just didn't know how to be like, so I was just like, I mean, I was just raised to be like, hey, hey, hey. Um, don't do that out there. Just can't afford to be nice on the trail, but you also have to walk that fine line of like, not pissing the men off too much because then they may take it out on you. It's really kind of a case by case situation. Another woman, this 28 year old in Germany with stock, had a stalker on the PCT, Pacific Trust Crest Trail, which is, you know, the one that was in wild and whatever. That's like the, west the version of the rocky mountain version of the appalachian trail which is i think is way longer and way crazier but the appalachian trail the biggest danger on the appalachian trail because it goes through so many like area like towns and stuff is the people you're running into a lot of people and the people are always going to be more dangerous and especially men than any animal you would ever run into for her Stranger danger wasn't the problem in the end. Like a lot of women I talked to, it wasn't some creepy guy or some dude. It was literally the people they trusted. Eight weeks she hiked with this dude. He seemed chill and supportive. And you know, being on the trail, you do end up being in like more intimate situations. A lot of times you're literally sleeping right next to somebody. You're changing in close proximity. When it's cold, like, like there's been many times when I, you know, even on the Appalachian Trail where I was so cold from being wet from all the rain that me and like, my other coworkers were like hugging each other and trying to get, you know, keep each other warm with body heat. So, but in those situations, who do you think is going to take advantage of that? <laughs> Give you one guess. This dude she was huddling with to stay warm got a bone. And then instead of, you know, she had no judgment over that. He can't control his body. But that's when things got weird. She says, I didn't blame him for getting a hum -hum at all. But when she casually reminded him that she had a boyfriend back home, he flipped a switch and started mocking her and being super mean. 
she eventually left him because he made the trail so intolerable for her. And then Beth, this 39 year old woman, had some dude that she was hiking with and he stuck to her like glue. You think these men are lonely in like general? Try the men on the trail. They got no distraction. They got no TV or games or whatever. So they, what they do is they find women to keep them company from themselves because they don't know how to be alone with themselves because they hate themselves. She had this one guy who was hovering over her constantly, even when she needed alone time. She tried to hike ahead several times, but he'd always catch up. She reminded him at a certain point that she was in a committed relationship with someone back home, and he started making comments on her appearance and how attractive she was. One day, he walked up on her changing clothes in one of the shelters, and despite her warning him, um, he saw her full frontal naked. Then got defensive that she was upset. She was I was completely humiliated. I had to convince myself it was no big deal. She eventually tried to ditch him for good, afraid of his reaction to feeling rejected. She, um, she waited until they were in a hostel, like in a town, like with witnesses. I understand that. I had to do that when it, with my ex. I was like, I'm afraid to be alone with you because... So anyway, women do this. They like wait until they're around people. She broke the news to him when they were around people and his, li his face literally blackened. We know what that means, right? Those pupils get black. She started to feel safe once the trail logs, you know, you sign in and stuff like that. Where um, They indicated that he was two to three days ahead of her. Then she ran into him and he admitted he'd seen her name registered in a hostel and took a zero day, which means he didn't hike at all just to wait for her. So panicked, she ran after another guy hiking by, told him she was being stalked and asked if, she, if he let her hike with him for a bit. Her stalker passed them shortly after and was never seen again. Beth and her new hiking partner, who became a dear friend, hiked all the way to Maine together. So this woman was trying to hike alone, you know, and just kind of be like doing her own thing, maybe hike with someone now and then, you know, by herself. A lot of women do that. They want to do this. It's for them. It's for them. They want to do this and they meet people and then they want to do their own thing. And these men won't let them. They stalk them. So then she had to hike with this dude who became, you know, a friend. But when you've been stalked, you don't want to be alone anymore. So she completed the whole trail with someone else because this man scared the crap out of her. As women, we're programmed to be nice and polite. And I actually found it harder to advocate for myself because I had gotten to know this guy. Ding, 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 ding. That's what I'm saying. You know, stranger danger is a thing, but we need to be way more afraid of the men who are playing the long game, whether it's in our hometown or whatever, or even on the trail. It says other men have since tried to attach themselves to her on long distance hikes, but she learned how to protect herself soon. So like, th th this is like a theme throughout this whole thing. All these women are like, God, these men won't just, they're so needy and they're so desperate. They're literally like, you know, glue. They literally glue themselves to these women. Basically, it's like, yeah, I don't, <laughs> she started to try to not come across as compliant and sweet because those are the men who, you know, just immediately are like, cool, this one. Not saying that like, not to victim blame because these men will go after anyone, but they definitely go after women who are more compliant. But then there's Jessica's story. And this story still gives me nightmares. I really enjoyed interviewing her and her boyfriend. Um, I was so, I feel so privileged that she shared this with me and the way she shared it. And I'm glad I, that I was able to tell the story for her, but I still think about her and I, I'm just still so mad about what happened to her. She was 38. She decided to do the, the Appalachian Trail as this big thing for herself after I think being a nurse or whatever. She met her, st her stalker who I'm going to call Doc and he seemed charming and generous and cool. And she made it very clear from the beginning that she had a boyfriend and wasn't interested in a relationship. And he was like part of her little tramley. She, he eventually, of course, started to express interest in her and asking about her relationship. And she says, I didn't know if it was an overreaction on my part or if I'm gaslighting myself. Just something that a lot of women really struggle with in general, but especially out there. But the thing that I wanted to note here is that throughout this whole story, she was really hesitant to say the word stalking. And I literally was like, this man was stalking you. And it's like, she knows that. But even like years after this experience, she still, in telling her own story, kept minimizing it. I found that so relatable and frustrating because just you're, wait and see what happened to her. And she's still like, didn't want to call him a stalker. And I'm like, no, this is stalking because that is such, that's what like, that's what we do is we're like, well, we still blame ourselves and, and downplay it. And it's a, you know, self-protective mechanism too, but. It started off when they were crashing in shelters. He tried to scoot his mattress to sleep next to her. His little sleeping mat. He wouldn't avert his eyes when she would announce she was changing. And he even she even <laughs> caught him staring at her while she was at the privy, which is the, like, outhouse. Imagine this uh, someone watching you use the bathroom. Sicko. One day he went on some hostile rant over the smallest thing, and she knew then he was totally unstable. It was another woman brief briefly hiking with them, 
a psychologist who helped her realize that he was obsessed with her and that she needed to get rid of him. So again, it was another woman who intervened and was like, you're in danger, you need to distance yourself from this person. I don't know what she would have done if she hadn't had the support of women and her boyfriend um, because men were completely worthless. He even resorted to slack packing to get distance from this dude, which is basically paying someone to drive her like a way far, skipping parts of the train to get away from this. Okay, I moved inside to do the rest of this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a second, but um, the, the, the expense of paying someone to drive you farther so you can get away from a stalker is just another way that is just more expensive. You know, in a city or in just wherever, maybe you have to take an Uber home because it's safer than walking or the subway or whatever. This is the kind of stuff. This stuff is so expensive just to stay safe. The other thing, another expense is she bought a new tent. So in addition to buying a new tent, tents are not cheap. They're very expensive. You need a really good tent and on the Appalachian Trail because rain and all that stuff, like your life is gonna be much worse if you don't have a good quality tent and it's just gear in general, shoe, boots or whatever. She also was pushing her body to the limit, hiking as hard as she could, as fast as she could to get away from this man. Trying to ca camouflage herself and outrun this dude, which again is expensive financially and on her body. Whenever she thought she was far enough ahead of him, another hiker would say that he was nearby. Like people were aware of this. Doc eventually caught up to her at a hostel after paying someone to drive him up the road. So <laughs> she was paying someone to get away. He was paying someone to follow her. He was obsessed with her. Not just her, but especially her. She finally filed a police report so at least that they would, uh, there would there'd be a paper trail basically and he would be on their radar. Hostel, this is what really pisses me. Hostel workers promised her not to welcome him. But in the end, only one kept his word. The rest gave him the benefit of the doubt. Cohen thinks it was as easily, uh, this is just easier to take his money and let him stay there, basically. Other hikers along the way almost also promised to back her up and help her. But when it came to actually doing anything, these protectors that men claim to be, they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything to help her. None of them stepped up. Despite having mostly pleasant encounters with men on the trail, their blind eye approach was disappointing. I think a lot of men are guilty of taking the path of least resistance. These men will pay $18,000 to go to a boot camp to have some former military dude beat them up, right? They will like pay to make their lives so much harder in certain ways. And then when it comes to being a protector or a provider, of anything but stress and autoimmune diseases. They don't show up, They're, they won't do it. They want the easy way out. They don't wanna stand up to men. They don't wanna put themselves in harm's way. In my own personal experience, it has almost always been women who have put their lives in danger or have sacrificed things for my safety, right? Never men, men just brought more danger. So she kept her boyfriend, Cowboy. I, I loved it, he was really fun to talk to. Cowboy, uh, he uh, appraised of the situation the whole time. You have no idea how much sleep I lost, he said. I was sitting at home worrying about her and about this. Um, right after he dropped her off at the beginning of the hike, this James Jordan, the, the, the Schmurder case happened. And uh, he was really worried. He's like, wow, there's like literally like an unaliver on the trail that my girlfriend's on. But he said, I knew how important this was for her. You know, but it just pissed me off that, the, that, he, this, that this man, this stalker was ruining her trip. And of course, as women do, Sometimes we're overconfident and sometimes we're too proud and sometimes we don't want to involve anyone and, some, and we downplay it and we gaslight ourselves. Even though she told him that she had it handle, handled, uh, he finally drove 700 miles to make sure. Now that is what a protector would do. None of them, no one else, men don't do this. Some men do. And I love that Cowboy did this. He didn't go there to start trouble and be like, I'm going to save her. No. He still centered what she needed and kept, you know, anyway, we'll see. For instance, he stayed with her at night and ran the shuttle for fellow hikers during the day while she hiked, right? He knew she wanted to do this. It was so important to her to hike this thing, right? It was really important to her. So to keep himself busy and useful, which is what most men should be thinking, how can I be useful? But a lot of them are just too selfish to do that. He kept himself busy by helping other hikers, shuttling the ones who wanted to get ahead. He says he met at least a half a dozen women who'd done a lot of night hiking and busted their arms to get away from the same guy. And so the two of them, this couple, they were trying to warn everyone about this doc guy. One day, uh, Cowboy 
saw, actually saw the dude at a campsite and he decided to confront him. But he had Googled the guy and he knew that this guy was a multiple felon and had been charged, charged with unlawful imprisonment of a woman. Shocker. Shocker. But knowing that about this man, he said, I wanted to spray the man and kick him <laughs> until, he, until he's tired. But I didn't want to go to jail. See, again, this is a man who's actually thinking about the consequences of being a hero, right? Like he doesn't want to go to jail. He doesn't want to die himself. But he also like really figured that the cops aren't doing anything. No one's doing anything to protect his girlfriend. So he decided to just kind of go up and, you know, I think he's a big guy. So he went up to him and he told him uh, he knew he was stalking women. Harshly warned him to stay away. I guess just to inform this man, look, I know, I know what you're doing, but I'm watching out for these women. This is the only way men will stop is if they know that there's a consequence and even that won't stop them. But at least this man knowing that there's someone watching him, a man, gave, uh, you know, the women a little bit more protection. Before leaving to go home, he drove, uh, he drove her 200 miles up the road to get her a safe distance from Doc. Shortly after, though, they picked up another hitchhiker and she was running away from Doc. That's when she realized this just wasn't fun anymore. I should not, I should only have to worry about where I'm getting water and where I'm going to sleep, she said. Not if he's going to turn up. He made it um, a few hundred miles further, but finally gave up. Instead of enjoying any hard-earned, hard-earned sense of accomplishment or pride for hiking 1,000 miles, she couldn't feel excited about her milestone. It all seemed pointless. I felt, I felt like I was running for my life every day. I encountered a lot of promises of support that didn't really hold up. Except for my boyfriend, I didn't see anyone else confronting him or calling him on his crap. I think they all just wanted to stay away, especially because that one dude had been unalive. Now, that's not surprising, but men don't have to confront a stalker or do what they think they have to do. Literally, their presence alone gives her safety. The threat of another man. She, she's still amazed that one man could affect hundreds of miles of hiking for so many people. More than anything, she hopes that this story will lead men to step up, or at the very least, believe women. I interviewed this woman, Missy. She's a 49-year-old. She's, she's done this many times. She has this approach where she tries to play it cool and never give gives any hugs or smiles too much. She says, and the men, well, they just get the hype. Being older and more experienced on the Appalachian Trail made her a lot more confident than like a 20-something year old usually. And she, she's like, I'm one tough motherfucker. And I think her age and her confidence and her like the front that she had keeps a lot of guys off of her. But even that didn't keep her from getting a stalker. So there's a one guy that was a part of their little tramley and we're gonna call him Bear. You know, a uh, man named Bear is way more dangerous than a literal bear. He had been like, you know, kind of aggressive and la la la. But then uh, when he appeared the third time and started to verbally assault her, she and her tramley hiked four hours in the middle of the night to get away from this dude. They later reported him to the authorities. In the end, she had to skip the whole state of New Jersey. The whole state of New Jersey because of this dude. And half of New York just to get away from Bear the man, but she went back and completed that, those sections later on to feel that sense of accomplishment. But these, this detour and round trip, uh, return trip cost her nearly 600 bucks. So, well, let's not even add the emotional, you know, the cost on our bodies, our minds, our peace and all that. That's so literally $600 more that she spent than any, the average person because of men. Whether it's the actual price of shuttles, extra nights in hostels, a new tent to camouflage yourself, or the emotional burden of fearing for your life, the female tax is a hefty one, even in the forkin' woods. Now, uh, I did interview a guy uh, who was a hiker, you know, uh, on the trail, and he's done it a lot, Eric. And he was trying to basically give tips for men to be more thoughtful and aware of why women have to be more cautious out there. And to literally not, like, this is a different world. You need to behave differently because the stakes are higher. He's talking about how men need to learn how to use more self-restraint and be more supportive of women than they would be even back home. You want to be, make sure that you're not being creepy because a lot of times, you know, in these environments, like, people are whipping off clothes and they're peeing in the woods next to you. That men need to be very thoughtful about turning away and being, like, overly conservative with all, like, Basically, the way women have to be so aware of everything we do, men need to start having that mentality. 
Give them their privacy and their space when they need it. Keep your distance and don't touch them. Don't hug them. Don't just leave them alone. In terms of like all that stuff, you have to learn how to, you have to acclimate to how to interact with women and not freak them out because they have to assume that you might unalive them more so than they would in any other environment because there's nothing to protect them out there. He says that some day hikers and locals will hang out at the trail waiting for women and that sometimes men have to take stuff into their own hands. So at one point in time, uh, another male hiker exposed himself to a woman and he invited her to hike with their group. That's what he's encouraging men to do who are on the trail or just in general. Everything I'm saying here, you can literally apply outside, off the trail. If you see a woman in danger, go talk to her in, in a way, you know, like just be like, go pretend like, oh, hey, I haven't seen it. Like we've seen videos on this. Y'all know what to do by now, right? So out on the trail, if he saw a woman in he was like always trying to keep an eye on the women in terms of like not invading their space, not talking to them, not asking for their social media handles and all that stuff. Literally just being hyper aware of the environment and the safety issue. Whenever he saw a woman, you know, and who seemed be giving off body language that she was uncomfortable, he would keep an eye on her, right? Or offer to let the, her join their group to give her a safety in numbers until she was out of that situation and then could, you know, decide to do whatever she wanted, obviously. Like maybe she wants to hike alone, she just needs to get away from this dude for a while. That's what men need to be doing. Not being like, oh, uh, gaslighting all that crap. He says, and look at it this way, uh, it's already hard enough. Uh, <laughs> women don't need all, any crap for men too out there. Uh, he said, any women who seem spooks, he lets them latch onto her and says these men are less likely to approach women if she's already with a guy. And just let the, these men think that she's with that man, even if just for 10 minutes. So he doesn't think she's alone. He says he never asked them for their phone numbers, their real names, right? Because they use trail names out there. Or, you know, social media handles because he knows that men are harassing and stalking them online too. And, you know, when, when Missy goes hiking, she never gives her actual, like, location and she at one point she was just like fuck i just want to hike right but you have to do all this stuff all this stuff and so one of the things that she does is she's very active on this facebook group which brings me back to that these facebook groups while they are keeping a lot of women safe they're not keeping all women safe so i interviewed um shalia uh, curtis this is her handle on um insta she's awesome you should go check out what all she's doing and she talks a lot about how the intersection of all these issues being a black woman and queer in the woods dealing with all the things that she's already got to deal with but in the woods with with no one there to protect her so when i interviewed her she said as a black woman and a lesbian she's not sure uh who will have her back out there and that she's already had harassment you know on her daily hikes and stuff and even in these very facebook groups these appalachian trail groups she said white men have already uh been harassing her there doing this whole hikers lives matter crap um, accusing her of race baiting and stuff. Whenever she tries to mention racism on the trails, we need to make these groups a safe space for everyone, not just white members, as, back, as black people do like to hike. If you want to read um, a personal essay about that, this is great. Tria Graham, she wrote for Outside Magazine. This essay, highly recommend. This title alone, Out There, No One Can Hear You Scream. Also this, um, this group called the Melanin Base Camp, they're also on Insta and basically trying to make the outdoors inclusive instead of just white people colonizing the outdoors too. You know what I mean? Just a, a white people taking over everything and making these spaces inclusive and safe, accessible. I've talked about this before too in the climbing community. Uh, I'm sure I'll talk about it again. But how the indigenous people are boxed out of climbing and they're, they're on stolen land. Anyway, sorry, that's a whole nother video. I also want to say that even the, the female, uh, the women's Facebook groups, white women made that, the, that group not safe for black women. You know, that's not surprising, but like even the Facebook groups don't protect black women. On the trail, the Facebook, social, literally they don't know if anyone is going to help them stay safe from all the dangers. So before I start wrapping this up, I wanna give some advice on how to stay safe out there because again, the whole point of this is not to scare people away from the outdoor. It is to become more aware and educated on how to stay safe. And literally the outdoors at the end of the day is way safer than your house. If there is, if you ever let men into your house. But 
You may be hiking alone. If you want to do that, you need to think about a lot of things and be prepared. Listen to um, the, the women that I mentioned before. They've done great podcasts, all these issues, but just educate yourself so you know what to look for and what to do and have a plan of action. Um, because it, 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 it's, the, the solution is not women just stay home. That's what they want. And that's why I said the whole men punching women in the face thing. I'm like, well, yeah, of course, but like, what's new? They're punching those women at home. Why would they not punch women in public? You will never convince me that the home is not the most dangerous place for women. And that has literally been my personal experience as someone who encountered bears all the time and did couch surfing and lived in my truck for five years and did the most dangerous sports and climbing and, and, and hanging off of cliffs on, you know, little pitons and stuff. And none of that was ever as dangerous as getting in a relationship with a man. Never. Never. So if you do decide to do stuff like this, some of the things you can look for is to learn how to trust your intuition and not uh, and avoid gaslighting yourself, being too nice. Always sign the guest books as two people or use a male, uh, mem male name or ambiguous. Invent a dude backstory. You know, it's like whatever. Lie about having... You're a guy friend with you. Oh, he's, he's right behind me, right? Like, uh, you know, don't be too proud to throw a fake boyfriend out there because the stakes are too high to like take any chances. All it takes is one man. All it takes is one. Never post photos of recognizable spots on social media, especially if you're anywhere near those spots. And don't be afraid of being too extreme in terms of like, you know, something just doesn't feel right. So I'm going to leave this person. And if I could give any personal advice, Try to have, be near women. Maybe you don't hike with them. Maybe you're alone, but talk to women. Just oh, women, women, women are the only people who have ever kept most women safe. Women and femme. Basically, the outdoors is a place uh, where all of the stuff we have to deal with is more intense out there. It's more obvious. And even our relationship with bears. Bears are not predators. They want nothing to do with us. They want to be left alone in peace, eating their berries and their huckleberries and their little whatever. They don't want to eat us. They don't want to scare us. They don't want to threaten us. All they want is to be left alone and to make sure their basic bear needs are met. And men, on the other hand, literally, a lot of them are literally there to do nothing but terrorize us. You will never find that in a bear. Even the one who ate the grizzly man and his girlfriend, even that one, was probably so sick of that man's crap. I did a whole series. I need to go back and redo that series because I have way more to say. Uh, grizzly man is literally one of the best examples of all the things wrong with men. <laughs> like, uh, and patriarchy and the intersection of a lot of these things. Um, but even that bear, it seemed to like be almost stalking them. It's because that forker wouldn't, wouldn't leave them alone. And they got tired of his stuff. He deserved to get eaten. His girlfriend did not. Be afraid of the outdoors. Don't be afraid of animals like bears. Be afraid of men because they are the predator. And they are the ones either quickly or slowly unaliving us when we let them into our lives or have to deal with them in public. And until proven otherwise, they will always be more dangerous than any bear in my book. Set notifications, like, comment, share, do all the things to help this video get out there to my subs. Let me know if you want a deep dive on Grizzly Man, because that dude was a... Uh, and thank you for your time.